I'm Jess McIntosh, I'm from the University of Bristol, and I'm here today to present my work, Sensor, which is detecting hand gestures with a wearable bracelet using infrared transmission and reflection. And this work is done in collaboration with my colleague, Azir Mazo, and my supervisor, Mike Fraser. So let me begin with a brief introduction and set the motivation for this work. Um, so we can use hand gestures explicitly to conveniently control wearable devices, um, as seen in previous work um, during this session with Pyro. Uh, so we can use this to uh, control devices in our surroundings too. But we can also detect our actions that we do implicitly, uh, and this allows us to monitor daily activities, or cues for contextual awareness, or bad habits. But for either use case, it's clear that they're mobile applications, and therefore the sen sensing apparatus must also be portable. So smartwatches are already seen as a socially acceptable placement for wearable, and the watch strap conveniently allows space for sensors. Uh, so for these reasons, a lot of work has gone into placing the sensors here to detect the hand pose. So there's a variety of different sensing methods that's been uh, achieved to ease, uh, used to achieve this, and uh, there is associated properties that determine the method's strength and weaknesses. Uh, but in this work, uh, we don't compare the sensing methods. Instead, we simply try to improve the accuracy of the existing infrared sensing method uh, without sacrificing size, efficiency, or practicality. So there's been lots of previous work on wrist-worn gesture detectors using infrared, but the, but the basic principle of operation is the same for all of these, and indeed for other techniques too. Uh, so this principle relies on the deformation of the shape of the wrist uh, as gestures are performed due to the moving anatomical parts within. So let's look at the previous work in a bit more detail. So here's a cross section of a wrist, and this might be a typical bracelet with uh, infrared sensors embedded. And there will be multiple pairs of emitters and receivers of infrared light. So these each sense the distance to the skin and thereby sensing the deformation of the shape of the wrist. It is important to note here that each pair works individually in this configuration. So I'll refer to this from now on as a one-to-one -one emitter to receiver configuration. But we know that infrared light of particular wavelengths can actually pass through flesh diffusely. So inspired by this, we made small changes to the previous configuration where instead now every infrared sensor measures the light level uh, when any one LED is emitting. So now addition to, in addition to what we had previously, uh, the adjacent sensors also pick up reflections from the skin and we also get some amount of light being transmitted through which infers distance and possibly captures some of the morphological changes that happen within such as bones moving. Uh, so the device can uh, multiplex through each LED uh, to collect a matrix of brightness values. So we have a row for each emitter and each column representing the receiving elements. So then we feed this, uh, the raw data values from this matrix into a neural network in order to classify gestures. So here's what our prototype looks like. Uh, there are 14 segments in total, and each segment has an LED and a photodiode with a peak sensitivity of 860 nanometers. And this is all connected to a signal generation and acquisition circuit, which then relays the information back to a PC for classification. So to test this configuration, uh, we conducted a user study, uh, which the participants found incredibly interesting. Uh, so we chose a variety of gestures, uh, including pinches, multi-finger, and wrist. And each of the gestures were performed 10 times. So after collecting the, the data from the study, we wanted to compare two things. So firstly, to compare the predictive accuracies of the system when using the traditional one-to-one -one system against our new one-to-many system. And secondly, to see how the number and arrangement of the different segments uh, might affect the predictive accuracy. So here are our results. So it's clear that using all the features from the one-to-many system is better than using only single reflective measurements, uh, and significantly so for the first three. Um, it is worth, worth noting that, in fact, the smartwatch configuration um, did not suffer from a, a major decrease in performance, uh, nor did actually halving the elements here, uh, but actually four segments did 
suffer quite a lot, but um, that could be used for gesture onset detection, for instance. Uh, so in addition to this uh, study, we did some additional preliminary studies to investigate the effects of cross-sessional misalignment, uh, non-sedentary postures, and skin coupling. So sensor misalignment occurs when the device is taken off and back on between sessions. So there is usually some misalignment between the sensors, and this can lead to a classification error uh, due to a shift in the features. Uh, so detecting this uh, misalignment is a first step towards calibrating the device uh, to account for the shift. So we tried using a neural network regressor on the data from the uh, neutral hand pose, and we found that we could in fact detect the shift um, reasonably well. So the second study that we tried to do was uh, a non-sedentary study. So uh, during the main study, the users were sitting down in a fixed position and instructed to keep their arms still. Uh, but people are likely to be moving around uh, and moving their arms in different positions uh, when in real use. So we tested the system with three different arm elevations and three different arm rotations. And we found that the accuracy still remains quite good in both cases, but as expected, the rotational changes to the forearm makes classification more difficult. And finally, uh, there may be some circumstances when the device is maybe not tight around the wrist in some places, uh, and the sensors aren't quite touching the skin. Uh, so we conducted some simple tests, uh, purposefully introducing gaps, and even putting some latex between the band and the skin. Uh, and we found that the accuracy was uh, largely unaffected still. So to summarize, uh, we've demonstrated that a one-to-many system is superior to the previous one-to-one -one systems. And this only requires a minor modification to actually achieve this. And finally, some preliminary work suggests that calibration could work quite well, and the technique is fairly robust to natural movement. Thank you very much for listening. I'll take any questions you have. My name is Kunu Park from KAIST. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question about the uh, uh, lights through the, the wrist. You said two kinds of uh, light path. First one, is, first one is reflected by skin, and second one is light, uh, lights that goes through the wrist. So I, my question is that how much uh, does the light through the skin affect to the uh, final re uh, classification result? Is it really important to, to measure the, those lights uh, that comes, I mean, goes through the skin? So, so you're asking about like, the dy dynamic range of it or something? Uh, no, I mean, like, uh, is it important to, to measure, I mean, like, for example, if you, the light uh, is emitted in this part and you are also measuring the sensor from this part, right? Is it uh, important to measure uh, those, like, far... Uh, yeah, it, it, it does depend on the distance. Some, in some cases, uh, some users' wrists were quite large and therefore the, the light doesn't transmit all the way through. Um, so oftentimes it's just, you know, sometimes the ones around the edges and not quite opposite, but kind of, you know, uh, sort of four o'clock, five o'clock position can be detected. So, yeah. the, so you're saying that major part of the, I mean, it's important to uh, measure the uh, adjacent uh, sensors, right? Sorry? You're, it's, I mean, you're saying it's, it's, it is important to measure uh, values in adjacent uh, uh, sensors. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Questions? I have one for you. Um, so, to what extent uh, is this robust to environmental interference, like from other light? Like, if I'm on a bright, uh, sunny beach and I have a lot of ambient infrared and things, but it's all kind of inside the wrist. So, is it is it actually pretty safe for, um, against all that? So, th there is some light leakage, but I think you can you can use techniques taken from other fields. Um, such as the, you know, the near-infrared um, brain sort of imaging stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and they use techniques where they can mitigate this kind of uh, light leakage by just subtracting the background noise mm -hmm. from, uh, from your readings.